Thank you very much, Mr. Nile. It is uh, wonderful of you to give us this time. You're the Reverend Fred Nile, and uh, you're a clergyman in Parliament, That's as right. you have long been. I wanted to ask you about the recent inquiry, which you just folded up. And I wanted to start with a particular constitutional question, which became a question of some moment. Mm -hmm. And that was the fact that I think very soon after you indicated the inquiry was starting, the Premier prorogued the Parliament, I think on the 21st of December. That's right. And there was a debate about the effect of the prorogation, mm -hmm. whether it meant that your committee could no longer operate. There was only about half an hour difference between the official commencement of the inquiry, that is when the clerk got my letter stating that with all the names of the committee members requesting the inquiry and the clerk signed at 11.05 and I understand at 11.45 the Special Gazette arrived uh, in the name of the Governor, obviously organised by the Premier, which raises the question as it was a preemptive attack on the inquiry, there's no doubt about that, and the Government had a calendar of dates and prorogation was to occur uh, later in February. In February. So the question is, what advice did the Premier give to the Governor to justify this urgent issuing of a prorogation notice? And in my opinion, uh, she would have misled the Governor. If you told the Governor the truth, the Governor would have said, I can't cooperate in that. Indeed. Uh, then there was a debate, wasn't there, over the effect of the Constitution mm. and also the standing orders. Mm. And as I recall, and please correct me if I'm wrong, the standing orders seem to give your committee the power to operate during the life of the Parliament. That's right. That suggested it went beyond prorogation. Yes, the prorogation has no impact on the committee at all. The we're, we're operating under the life of the Parliament, and so that made the committee legitimate and that was according to the, the ruling of the clerks, and that's, that's really the Bible for the Parliament. The clerks make a ruling, uh, the clerk gives advice to the, to the President, and the President accepts the advice. So the clerk was adamant, and I, I got that advice in writing then, but we also got Brett Walker, uh, Senior Counsel, formerly a Queen's Counsel, to confirm that advice, and he came back saying yes, it was absolutely correct, and it was clear that the government was seeking to obstruct the inquiry. Yes, I read Mr Walker's opinion mm. on uh, the website of the committee. It's a very persuasive opinion, mm. I think. I agree with it entirely, not, yes. not that I'm an expert in the field. But it's if you just look at the plain English of the standing order, mm. it seems to clearly suggest that the power extends beyond prorogation. And there is a practice in the Parliament that quite a few committees do meet and actually have authority to meet during prorogation. So it's not unusual for parliamentary committees to meet. So many of the committees in the Assembly have already anticipated this problem, perhaps some years ago, and so their, their standing orders include their committees can meet even if Parliament's prorogued. And I'm sure when Parliament uh, reassembles in the, after the election, I'll make sure we get an amendment to make it absolutely clear the prorogation uh, never stops an upper house committee operating. I know it. I know it has a legal power, but just to put it in absolutely uh, black and white, uh, I believe I, I would do that. And no doubt you would have the support of uh, the new government. Yes.